happy little games. Hello everybody and thanks for coming back for the third installment in the history of Castlevania. When I started this series I thought it might be two parts but yet here we are with part three and plenty more games to cover. But enough hubbub, let's get on with the show. In 2003, released for the Game Boy Advance was Castlevania Harmony of Dissonance. This was produced by Koji Igarashi who was co-producer on Symphony of the Night. One of the big complaints from Circle of the Moon on the Game Boy Advance was the visuals were too dark and murky. Konami decided to crank those visuals up to 11. The last time my eyeballs melted like this, I walked into my ex-girlfriend who was taking a shower. Now I never had a problem with the original visuals because I always used a good third party light, but I can understand the complaints from other people. Again with the advancement of backlit technology and emulation, it's no longer a problem. The game takes place 50 years after Simon Belmont has vanquished Dracula. The story revolves around Juiced Belmont, the first time a Belmont has starred in a Castlevania game since Dracula X. He has to rescue his childhood friend Liddy Erlanger from the dastardly clutches of the nefarious Count Dracula. The gameplay is typical Castlevania fare with you brandishing your whip and it feels fantastic. The sub weapons are also back but this time they can be combined with five different spell books including fire, Ice, Bolt, Wind, and the Summoning. If you manage to use one of these books, you are invincible for a short period of time. Another new addition is the Dash Move, which can be activated by pressing L and R and gives you a short burst of speed, which is really helpful for dealing with the onslaught of enemies. The role playing element makes its return with your character increasing his stats with the more enemies you kill. There are basically two castles in the game, Castle A and Castle B, which have different enemy types and placements, weapons, and other aspects. It is possible to locate special warp rooms which will transport you between the two. The graphics are nice and detailed with plenty of colors to boot. The sprites are well animated and there is a nice variety of enemies although not quite as diverse as Symphony of the Night. The bosses are large segmented creatures using various scaling and rotation effects. The sound effects and music are unfortunately simply adequate. While they get the job done, it's simply meh in my opinion. There are a few unlockables such as a boss rush mode and also characters for you to play as once you complete the game. This is an excellent follow up to Circle of the Moon and a worthy addition to the Castlevania franchise but the best was yet to come. In 2003, also for the Game Boy Advance, was Castlevania Area of Sorrow. When it came time to replicating the look and feel of Symphony of the Night in the palm of your hand, the third time must have been the charm because this one comes the closest to pulling it off. As the story goes, Dracula was defeated in the year 1999 and his powers were imprisoned in a solar eclipse. After his death, a prophecy was revealed that he would be reincarnated in his castle in the year 2035. You take on the role of Soma Cruz, who is an exchange student living in Japan who has to tackle the evil forces of Count Dracula. There are plenty of supporting characters to aid you in your quest as well. The gameplay is very similar to Symphony of the Night with Soma controlling very similar to Alucard using a sword instead of a whip. There are other standard weapons available as well, including hammers, although powerful, they are slow. All the abilities from symphonies such as sub-weapons, familiars, spells, and so forth are either reduced in power or missing entirely. 
In its place is something called the Tactical Soul System in which each enemy in the castle has a soul which can be randomly stolen after its defeat. Upon its defeat, you gain some sort of ability. For example, the skeletons will let you throw bones, zombies will let you throw grenades, and Legion will let you shoot out a trio of lasers using a spaceship of all things, similar to Konami's other franchise, Gradius. I prefer the standard sub-weapons, but I applaud their effort for wanting to freshen up the series with something just a little bit different. The only problem is that you have to do a bit of grinding and kill the same enemies over and over, which does get a bit tedious. The magic meter will automatically regenerate now, but it's very slow and can be replenished more quickly with hearts. The graphics are nicely detailed with smooth animation and excellent character designs. Similar to the last game, the bosses are huge with multi-jointed sprites which involve plenty of scaling and rotation. The last boss in particular is amazing to see. The music is fantastic and is a step up from the previous game with more resources being devoted to the audio this time around than the previous game. In 2003, Konami decided to dip its toes into the world of 3D once again with Castlevania Lament of Innocence. For the first time, the game takes place during 1094, exploring the origins of the Belmont and Dracula feud. The series focuses on Leon Belmont, who has to rescue his significant other, Sarah. You will encounter plenty of other characters, and the storyline has lots of twists and turns. The storyline also explains the origins of the vampire Killer Whip and Count Dracula. This was the first game to be released exclusively on the PlayStation 2 and overall they've done a pretty good job. The game runs at a silky smooth 60 frames per second and your character controls as smooth as melted butter. You can dodge, block and double jump. There are two different whip attacks, including a short, straight, less powerful one, and also a slow, more powerful, circular one, allowing you to string together combos. The whip can also be used to latch onto the ceiling and pull yourself up. You can acquire three more whips, which are guarded by three elemental bosses, fire, ice, and lightning. Exploring the castle is open-ended with plenty of puzzles to solve and plenty of hidden items to discover. At the start of the game is a portal with access to the five main areas. After you defeat the boss of each area, the final area becomes unlocked. There are various shops throughout the game which you can purchase upgrades to your stats and equipment. The sub-weapon system was taken almost verbatim from Harmony of Dissonance in which you can combine them with one of seven colored orbs, which are found after beating the stages. The RPG elements have been scaled back a bit, but they are still there to a degree. There are a few characters that you can play as once you complete the game, including a vampire and a little guy with a pumpkin head. The game puts to good use the PlayStation 2's powerful hardware with fantastic visuals and special effects. The characters and enemies are varied and well animated. The camera works really well this time around and although there is no manual setting, it's not really required. The music is head and shoulders above anything since Symphony of the Night and is almost as good. If you are a Castlevania fan, it's something you need to experience for yourself. While the game isn't perfect, it is pretty darn good, especially for a 3D attempt at a classic franchise. brought us Castlevania Dawn of Sorrow for the Nintendo DS. This was the first entry on the dual screen handheld and is a direct sequel to Area of Sorrow with the same cast of characters. 
The game takes place a year after the last one with Soma coming under attack by a cult leader named Celia, who is once again seeking the power of Count Dracula. She has two associates that were both born on the day that Dracula died and are open to receiving his powers. Soma sets out to the castle to right the wrongs and keep Dracula buried forever. There are various weapon choices this time around including axes, swords, spears, handguns and grenades with each one differing in their damage output. The tactical soul system makes its return but it works just a little bit differently this time around. The same soul can be multiplied which allows its strength to increase. Souls are divided into four categories including bullets, enchant, guardian and ability, but you can only have one equipped at one time. If you manage to receive the doppelganger soul, you can have two different weapons and soul settings. You can also exchange souls and forge new weapons, but it does require a lot more grinding. Thanks to the increased capabilities of the Nintendo DS, you can trade souls via Wi-Fi with other players in your area. Also, the dual screen is put to great use with something called a magic seal. Once the player reduces the hit points of an enemy, the player must draw certain symbols on the touchscreen. The further into the game you get, the more complex and detailed the designs that you have to draw become. The graphics are absolutely phenomenal and come very close to replicating the look and feel of Symphony of the Night. The sprites are large and detailed with beautiful animation. The backgrounds themselves are extremely detailed and some even feature polygonal parts. For a cartridge system, the music is spectacular with a wide variety of music available. Once again, the bosses are absolutely massive with them generally taking up the entire screen. The game does have an excellent post-game ending depending on if you get the good ending or the bad ending. It's very detailed and has a nice twist so I won't spoil it here. Overall though, it's an excellent first version for Nintendo's dual screen handheld. In 2005, Konami released Castlevania Curse of Darkness for the PlayStation 2 and the original Xbox. There were definitely a few growing pains translating the original 2D Castlevania onto a 3D platform, but the previous effort wasn't bad in my opinion. As the story goes, the game takes place in 1479, three years after the events of Castlevania 3 on the NES. Now even though Dracula was defeated at the hands of Trevor Belmont, his curse is still felt all throughout Europe with disease and famine spreading rapidly. You take on the role of Hector, a character who had served the Count of Darkness, leaves Dracula's castle and relinquishes his power living among humans. Hector's wife Rosalie is accused of witchcraft and is burned at the stake. Hector vows revenge on an old rival who had started the accusations on his beloved Rosalie. Hector is not a member of the Belmont clan, therefore he does not brandish the vampire killer whip. Instead though, he has the option of using various weapons throughout the game such as swords, axes, brass knuckles, and spears with each weapon having its own different types of combos. The action itself is much better balanced this time around and the combos seem to flow much better. Also new to the combat system are familiars known as innocent devils. The fairy devil includes healing, the bird devil allows swarms of creatures to attack your enemy, battle type which is very strong and there are also a few others as well. Each of the devils can level up independently of Hector and evolve differently. Speaking of leveling up, the RPG elements from the previous games have been restored so you finally have a reason to kill every enemy you see. 
The characters and animation are nice and smooth, but the backgrounds leave much to be desired. There are times you'll get lost in the castle just because the rooms all look so similar. Some of the rooms are extremely barren with only a couple of candles to destroy in each one. The automatic camera which worked so well in the last game has been replaced by a manual camera which, surprise, 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 doesn't work as good as it should. The music itself is a bright spot on this rather average game, so at least there is that. Throughout the game, you will discover chairs hidden throughout the land. It's even more bizarre once you find the chair room in which everyone you've discovered has been placed. After you complete the game, it is possible to play through it again as Richter Belmont brandishing the Vampire Killer Whip. In 2006, released for the Nintendo DS was Castlevania Portrait of Ruin. This is a continuation of the story from Castlevania Bloodlines on the Sega Genesis. The game takes place in 1944 during World War II in Europe. You take on the role of Jonathan Morris, who is the son of John, and his companion Charlotte as they attempt to take down the evil vampire Brawner and his two demonic daughters. This was the first game that allowed you to play as two different characters, each one with different attributes. Jonathan has the Vampire Killer, but since he is not a true Belmont, he cannot use it properly. But there are other weapons to be found. Charlotte uses magical attacks, with her main weapon being a book filled with spirits. The sub-weapons also make their return with boomerangs, daggers, axes, and grenades among others. Instead of the sub-weapons, Charlotte can equip sub-spells which include fire and ice and boosting your stats. You can switch between your characters at any time as they both share the same life bar. It is possible to have both characters on the screen at the same time with the other character shadowing the movements of the original. There are various puzzles throughout the game which sees you having to use both characters to solve them. The locales you visit are extremely varied, with the main hub this time being a hall full of paintings. Once you access these paintings, you are transported to Egypt, a forest, the foggy streets of London, and a mansion. There is also a level called the Nation of Fools, which is a combination of an upside-down castle and a funhouse. The backgrounds are detailed, but they tend to get repetitive. The sprites and animation are well defined and extremely smooth. Thanks to the varied locations you visit, there are 155 different enemy types you will encounter. The bosses reflect this once again with giant segmented pieces with a lot of them using scaling and rotation. There are four different single player modes for the main story and a boss rush mode which can be played with either one or two players. Alternate endings are also included. This was the first Castlevania game to offer cooperative multiplayer over either local Wi-Fi or Nintendo's Wi-Fi. The music is really good, and for the first time on a handheld, English voiceovers are provided. The Japanese voices are still in the game and can be unlocked as an Easter egg. Two thousand seven brought us the release of Castlevania: The Dracula X Chronicles on the PSP. English fans of the series who had always read about how great Rondo of Blood was on the PC Engine finally got a chance to check it out for themselves. The game comes with both the emulated version from the PC Engine as well as a brand new two point five D version, complete with brand new updated graphics. When the game was first released, a lot of people had a problem with the updated look. As you know, I am a sprite purist, but I think it looks fantastic. 
The attention to detail is second to none, especially in the background. Some of the other complaints included blurry textures, but to be honest, I never noticed it even back in the day. The game runs at a rock solid 30 frames per second and due to the PSP screen size, it now runs at 16x9 instead of 4x3. There are a couple of extra levels in the updated version as well. There are bonus items to locate, including a sound edit bonus which allows you to use either the original PC Engine music or the brand new rearrangement. One other complaint of the original game was that the final boss was just way too easy. In the original game, the only thing you received if you saved all of the maidens was an extra cutscene. In the remake though, it's just a little bit different. If you manage to save all of the maidens, a third, much more difficult boss will appear. It's not all gravy though, as the endings are completely different now for some reason. Symphony of the Night is also included as an unlockable extra. In my opinion, Konami did a fantastic job with this version. I think it's the perfect blend of standard 2D sprite based classic gaming and 3D polygons. And that takes care of part 3 on the history of Castlevania. Next week I'm going to have a brand new documentary as I've had my fill of garlic, winged creatures and neck bites, similar to when I got to third base with a mortician I was dating. There should only be one volume left which will be posted in the next couple of weeks. Thank you all for the nice words and the comments and glad you're enjoying the series so far. Thank you all so much for watching. If you like this video, please be sure to leave a comment, like, share, and subscribe. Also, if you'd like to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. Again, thank you so much for watching.